How's everyone doing today? Just ready for a, another dose of, uh, of substations 101. All right. Uh, this is uh, the third class in a sequence. And we're, uh, in this class, going to start talking about actual conductors and bus fittings and all that cool stuff. And uh, today's class, we're going to focus on the electrical aspects of it. All right, moving ahead. This is uh, the, the five-week look ahead. Again, today we're going to talk about uh, substation conductors, and uh, we're going to talk both about voltage issues and current issues. Now, I say that it's high and medium voltage because that's really what we have in substations. In low voltage, it's a completely different realm, and uh, we're really not going to address that in this class. Uh, again, next week um, we'll talk about the structural considerations in the same things that we talk about today, you know, how you put your conductors in the air, how you connect them together and all. Uh, you got to get it right electrically and you got to get it right structurally. Um, following that, I'm going to spend a class and talk about uh, conduit, grounding, and lighting designs. And in that class, I'm also going to talk about the design process of how we actually, you know, what's the sequence of activities that we go through to design a substation. And at that, in that same uh, discussion, I'm going to talk about the sequence of things you do to build a substation. And one of the things I really encourage, and I'm going to touch on this here even in this lecture, is as you go through your um, designs, get to know who's going to be building them and work with them. You know, do things that are going to make their jobs easier, and I assure you that if you, you, you know, if you work to make them successful, they in turn will work to make you successful. And, but if that relationship um, breaks down, it's really to no one's benefit. Okay, after we get through those classes, um, we're going to spend some time on design standards, and that may actually be more than one class, uh, still getting that planned out. And then I still uh, want to talk about Consulting 101, and I've got ideas for classes that uh, go beyond this. Okay, today um, we're going to talk about uh, first voltage issues because w as I'm sitting here planning these classes out, um, there's a huge body of knowledge that I'm trying to address, and it's kind of awkward to find a way to to take that first bite, you know, take that first step into the topic. And so the way I'm going to do it is today to talk about electrical things and break that into issues that have to do with voltage and then issues that have to do with current. And in each one, we'll, we'll kind of develop those concepts. And then we're going to end up with, many of you can see up front, I've gone around the office and collected a bunch of uh, knickknacks and doodads and souvenirs from people's projects. And I, I want to do a show and tell and explain uh, what all this stuff is. And actually, for once, I'm not going to use Google Earth at all. OK, any questions on that before we get going? All right. Voltage. OK, first off, this discussion is going to be all about air-insulated substations. Um, there's a, a whole type of substations called gas-insulated substations. Now, we're going to leave that for another day. Um, there aren't that many of them out there. This is by far, this will be 99.9% .9 of the projects that we do. And so I don't want to get you know, confused with trying to cover every single little possibility on it. Um, I want to talk first off about an electric field. If a piece of, of metal, we'll use this piece, you know, chunk of aluminum, if that is energized at a high voltage, let's just say it's 115 kV line to line, as you move away from that in air, you're going to have a lower voltage. There's a voltage gradient that will reduce, and at a certain distance away from you, it will be back down to zero, just to, you know the, the voltage that we're having here right now. Does that make sense? All right. Um, there are a number of different uh, ways to measure voltage in electrical systems. Um, we, when I said 115 kV, that is measuring conductor to conductor, and it's applying a, a, an odd simplification called root mean square. It's actually not, it's voltage. It's voltage you have to multiply by the square root of two. And 
that the average root mean square? Yeah, root mean square, think of as average. If you were to take our sine wave, and I've got a picture of it, next thing. If you were to take the sine wave, and if you were to, I don't have a cursor when I do that, and if you were to take all of the, just one of these, you know, one phase, we'll move that guy out of ways, and then you were to take, when it goes below zero and flop that over, and then take the average of it, that's what root mean square means. And oddly enough, there's a valuable thing that this gives us. When you're going back and forth to AC and DC, the numbers are the same. So if your root mean square in AC is one amp, it's going to give you the same, if you calculate it out, trust me, it's true, <laughs> it'll give you the same amount of, of energy and power, all the calculations go back and forth the same. And that simplifies a whole bunch of different things in conductors, because inevitably we will use some conductors, often it's, it's low voltage, but it actually works at high voltage as well, um, for both AC and DC. So anyway, it's an interesting simplification that we do. Now, if you want to know what, when we call something the, uh, uh, like 115 kV, it's taking the peak voltage on, say, A phase, as I'm showing here, and comparing it to where, let me, let me redo that. It's where B phase is there, and this, at the, the horizontal axis is time, so if you go down to the same spot as peak on B phase, and you hit A phase, that's the phase-to-phase -phase voltage. I probably didn't explain that very well. But it, uh, it, and if people have have questions about that, let me know after, you know, afterwards. Okay, um, you kind of need to you need to keep track of what voltage you're talking about as you're applying it to um, different aspects of your design. So it's a really good idea to spend a little bit of time, you know, just understanding that basic nomenclature. But I'm not going to go. Uh, too much deeper into it now. Now then, let's talk about flashover distances. Um, there's a substation as you're going down. Okay, if you're headed towards downtown, going on I-5, then you get in the lane to go to 405, and then you stay in the left and you go go to uh, uh, NATO Parkway. There's a Pacific Corps substation on the right. And unfortunately, they just built a light, light rail uh, in front of it, so you can't see this anymore. But used to, on the last insulator on the line, right before it enters the substation, you had an insulator, and then you had a little piece of metal um, from the top and the bottom that went together, and you had about, mm, about 20 inches between them. And that, that's a common practice in the old days, because what that is is a spark gap. It's a, a, a cheap person's uh, serge arrestor. And the, at, what it is is they're putting a piece of metal that's a little bit greater than the flashover distance for 115 kV. And so if you get a surge going down the line, rather than going into your equipment in the substation, potentially damaging something, it'll flash over there. Now, a modern surge arrestor is a far better way to accomplish this, but it's kind of interesting in that it illustrates, you know, the concept of flashover distance. Now, notice that this is a 60 hertz phenomenon. This is not taking into account transients. And we're going to see in a little bit that a, a typical insulator for 115, and again, if you could s still see this on that substation, it was really the perfect way to illustrate it. Um, the 115, again, flashover distance is right around 19 inches. Um, now, you're probably thinking, well, okay, if you only need 19 inches for 115, why do we make the insulators 45 inches tall? Now, why is our phase to ground so much more? Well, that is based on the, the uh, basic insulation level, or BIL, which is a transient uh, phenomena. And as much as we prefer that they weren't there, there are switching transients and lightning strikes on, uh, on the transmission system. They just happen. There's a number of different ways that you can cause them. Opening up a disconnect switch 
when the line's energized, oddly enough, produces a really high frequency transient. And if you happen to have a capacitor involved in that in some fashion, it'll make it even worse. Uh, cap bank switching will give you a nice, uh, a nice ooh, about 1.5 per unit uh, uh, surge if it's not handled properly. So there's a bunch of different things that cause that. And that's why we, we have to have insulation levels that are significantly greater than what you would need just for the, the uh, 60 hertz voltage that we, we put on the system. Does that make sense? Now, what happens when insulation fails? Well, you get a flashover um, where the current, um, and there's all sorts of good metaphors for this. Uh, I like the idea of a, a hose. You know, the, the flashover would be the same as your hose springing a leak. Except in this case, instead of water squ you know, squirting out, you're going to have um, what's going to, you know, it's going to feel, if you're very close to it, like an explosion. And a lot of energy is dissipated in a very short amount of time. And that's why we have protective relaying and all, all sorts of other features in the system so that if that happens, we can quickly uh, de-energize it and isolate the failed uh, component. Now, hopefully, when you have flashovers, it's a transient thing. Uh, no, no equipment is damaged, and uh, uh, the this equipment can be, or the line, whatever, can be re-energized. Uh, quite often, that's not the case. In fact, that's often why you have a fault, is you've had a piece of equipment fail. And that's kind of part of what we're trying to avoid as we go through the, the knowledge that I'm going to try and pass along to you in this and future classes. Any questions about that? Okay, notice we're not talking about current right now. Voltage is really, a, they're, they're closely related, but they're really not the same. This is just, think you could think of it as a few too many electrons have gotten together and are inhabiting a piece of uh, metal, and that's going to make them uh, have the potential to cause a flashover. I don't know. There, there's many ways to, to consider this. Okay, I want to now introduce the concept of insulators. And this is really our first uh, building piece that we're going to use to build a substation. In the picture that I've got on the screen, you can actually see quite a few insulators. This is a big disconnect switch. And notice that each pole in this disconnect switch has three insulators. And this is the blade. And the blade, this is the jaw. This is the hinge. And that blade will pull uh, vertically up. And it does so by having one of these insulators in the back rotate. So you know, you can see that an insulator is an integral part of a disconnect switch. We also use insulators just uh, to hold up, you know, hold conductors in the air. And this is a good example of one right here. Okay, it's on a pedestal, steel pedestal. There's foundation in the ground and then you bolt it to the base of the pedestal. And then, let me see if I've got a good picture of this. Yeah. And then on the top, you'll put a fitting. And there's a bolt pattern on the top of the insulator. You'll put a fitting on that. In this case, it's a parallel cable clamp. And then you can put your cable in, bolt it down, and it'll hold in place. Does that make sense? Now, these are, are rather large examples of insulators, and we've got a few more uh, oh, you know, to, to, to show you. Now, this is a kind of insulator called a, a station post insulator. And all it really is good at doing is holding conductors in the air. You can mount them vertically, horizontally, pretty much any way you want. Uh, and I'll go through in a minute uh, their various characteristics. But uh, again, just think of something that you're going to hold the conductor in the air with. All right, now here's a different kind of insulator. These are strain insulators, also called suspension insulators. And they do, rather than holding things, you know, holding weight up, they're good at countering tension. And so you can, each one of these, depending on its rating, can handle somewhere between 30,000 pounds and 50,000 pounds. Amazingly strong. In, in my mind. 
Now notice that in this case, you've got two conductors at the top uh, going out horizontally and two conductors vertically, but on the bottom assembly, you just have one insulator where the top assembly has two. Uh, and then you have jumpers going back and forth between them. And we'll talk about many of the uh, parts and pieces that are in this uh, when we get to show and tell. In fact, actually, probably a good idea to introduce some of them right now. This is, I borrowed from our transmission line guys, and this is a big suspension insulator. Th that end down there with, uh, I think that's called an anchor shack, although I'm not positive. Uh, on that end, that goes to the steel structure, and there's a thing on that called a vang that you'd unbolt that uh, shackle, I guess is the proper term, and put on, on the vang. And then at this side, this connects to your actual live parts. And notice it has a corona ring around the end of it. And the reason it does, and even um, some uh, relatively lower voltage uh, insulators like this have corona rings, and the reason is there's a real narrow part right here. And if you don't put the corona ring on it, you're going to get a, a lot of snap, crackle, pop out of this. And if you were to take a time lapse uh, picture of that at night, you'd see a big uh, blue glow if you don't put this on. And eventually it'll pit the, the steel and conceivably could cause a, uh, a failure. Um, as we look at this, this is probably a good idea to, um, let's talk about some of the characteristics of insulators. And again, this is a, a, a suspension. This is made out of polymer, and actually um, it's some sort of silicon compound. And then there's a big fiberglass rod inside the, you know, inside the thing, <clears throat> both of which have great dielectric uh, strength. Now, there's a number of different ways that flashovers occur, and one of them is, called, is due to creepage. And what creepage is, is the ability of electricity to conduct over, over the surface of you know, oh, pretty much anything. What you do is you get a little bit of contamination on it, and then that's going to start conducting current down it. And the way you avoid this from happening to your insulators is, uh, is through all these skirts on it. And if you were to take a piece of string and start at this end and run it over each skirt all the way to the bottom of it and take that string and straighten it out, that's the creepage distance. It's a rather important part of, uh, you know, uh, or characteristic of insulators. And when do you think you need more creepage distance? What kind of situations might you want to have extra creepage in your insulators? How about if you're near the beach? Well, what are you going to get near the beach? Some salt spray. Well, that can conduct electricity. How about if you're in, a, a, in an area where you're just going to have a lot of contamination? You know, a lot of dirt, a lot of grime. Maybe you're near an oil refiner or something. Well, these all can, can lead to flashovers. It's also why you have to occasionally wash your insulators. Okay, I don't have, unfortunately, I couldn't find one in the office, a good station post insulator. There, there are a few uh, little tiny distribution jobs around, but at the moment we don't have a good picture of a uh, station post insulator. So let me show you one. All right, this is from a company called LAP. And a lot of the companies, LAP and NJK Lock, that uh, make insulators are actually surprisingly old companies. NJK Lock is a Japanese company that has been around about five centuries. And their whole thing has been built around the uses of porcelain, which until um, oh, 100 or so years ago, was mainly for crockery, which is, you know, cooking stuff. But it's the same technology and the same basic principles of, of shaping and uh, firing wet porcelain that produces these. Now, if this were a 115 kV insulator, the height, and let's, let's just talk about the, the gray one on the side, the height of it would be 
uh, about 45 inches. And you'd have five inch bolt circles on the top. So you've got four bolts, and if you drew a circle in them, the diameter is five inches. And, and they're threaded, so, you, so you've got to put the, the bolts straight down into them. That's both top and bottom, unless you buy them with a different fitting on them. And you can order them. You know, there'll be special fittings, but you, you can get them like this brown one with a pedestal at the bottom of them. And again, it just depends on what your application is. Now then, in a typical substation or typical transmission system, there are lots of insulators. And occasionally, for whatever reason, you have to replace them. You don't want to have to, to go and, and re refit your steel to support a different kind of insulator. So standardization is actually pretty important in these. And it's so much so that in station post uh, insulators between the manufacturers, there's a system called the technical reference number, in, or the TR. And if you get a TR-287 from one manufacturer and get one from another, they will be identical. They'll have the same cantilever strength, the same weight, the same uh, 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 creepage distance, pretty much everything. Now, does that make sense? Has anyone ever heard of that before, by the way, the, the, the uh, TR or the TRN? I see a few heads nodding up and down. Okay. Hopefully at some point we could get one of these. It would be a good uh, little handy thing to have around the office. Okay, what are some of the other uh, characteristics of, uh, of insulators? And if for, for station post, the cantilever strength is, is real important, and there are TR numbers for both at each voltage for standard um, high strength and extra high strength. And the higher up you go in voltage, generally the more strength you need in them, and it gets a little more precarious because they're that much taller. Um, and it's an interesting problem that you can run into when you're using these in high seismic areas. Uh, you know, Southern California is certainly a place I've spent a lot of time, and uh, you put them up knowing that if the earthquake is bad enough, they're not going to survive, and they're going to snap off. But at, in the end, um, in certain cases, there's really nothing you can do about it. So you just have to do the best you can. Um, another concern is the, the connecting method. Again, I mentioned this, that um, typical uh, uh, station post insulators will have, uh, will have a bolt circle, a four bolt circle on them. In the case of this insulator, on the front end of it, whoops. We have this thing. I don't really even know the name of this. There's um, a type of fitting that this attaches to. And when, you, when you're putting all your parts and pieces together, it's really important that you get these details correct. If, if you order the wrong stuff, and the guys in, in the construction folks are out there trying to put it together, and we cause them delays, they're probably going to send us a bill for uh, well, what they call stand around time while they fix what we did. And we certainly don't want that. So again, one of the key parts in your work in doing design is to make sure that once it's time to build it, it's going to go together smoothly. And those are some of the ways that, trust me, I know, <laughs> that you can uh, uh, end up going wrong on, on these. Anyway, the last characteristic I want to talk about is the weight. Um, if nothing else, you need to know the weight so that when you do your steel design, you're uh, accounting for that weight properly. Okay, any questions about this? All right, another consideration for, uh, for the, that's related to voltage are your clearances in the substation. Okay, there's a thing called the RUS, which is, uh, well, it's what used to be the Rural Electric Association. It's the, the part of the um, government-sponsored part of, the, of uh, the electric utility. 
that electrified rural America. Anyway, they put together a chart. In fact, they put a whole, together a whole design guide that's still used commonly by a lot of utilities, but they put a chart together of electrical clearances. And years and years ago, I made a copy of it, and I put this in the back of, my, of this book, which is a, an Anderson catalog of all sorts of conductors that we use. If you, if you see one of these, you might want to snag it. I've had this one for, oh gosh, probably 15, 20 years. And, uh, and the nice thing about it, none of this stuff changes. So, you know, it's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow and properties of aluminum are different. But uh, anyway, if you go and, and read off the URS table for, uh, for phase to ground clearances, the minimum is, is 42, and uh, they recommend 45. And typical, ins you know, uh, I don't remember the TR number of a 115 insulator. I used to have that committed to memory. But anyway, the thing's 45 inches tall. And uh, that's where that comes from. OK, phase to phase clearance, they want uh, 53 inches, although typically we use a lot larger than 53. We'll usually go six, seven feet. And it actually depends on the type of disconnect switch you're using and how you're going to be using it, you may need to actually even uh, go wider uh, than that to maintain clearances. Uh, this is a question I love to stump people with, but why are phase-to-phase -phase clearances so much greater than phase-to-ground clearances? You know, in, in one case, we're not even using four feet, but in another case, we're using, you know, more than double that. Anyone care to guess why that is? Are phase-to-phase -phase voltages higher than phase-to-ground? That area, think of that area not in terms of the flashover from, one, from the, the 115 kV, like the 20 inches I was describing, uh, uh, you know, about that, that station downtown. Think of it as a transient phenomena for switching transients. And then you're more on, on line, but still even that, is uh, 45 inches is, is plenty sufficient for that? Well, the actual answer is there isn't a reason. There is no physical reason for that. And it actually dates back to a, a paper. I've never gone back and found the paper. But uh, um, some guy back in the 40s put out a paper that basically argued that we should have much greater face-to-face -face clearances than face-to-ground because face-to-face -face faults are so much more damaging uh, to equipment and to uh, system stability. So anyway, you're, uh, the, that's my trick question for the day. Why are they uh, greater? There really isn't a physical reason for it. But nonetheless, it's a normal, uh, a normal thing to, to make them greater. Now here's a question. Oh, bear with me a moment. If you're working for a large utility with established standards, obviously you're going to follow their standards when you do your, your work, when you do your design. What happens if you get a client, say it's a, a wind developer? They don't have standards. They barely understand electricity. They know how to sell electricity, but designing it, that's just not their thing. So now what do you do? Well, I would use the RUS uh, guidelines. You know, barring anything else, I, I would go with that. Um, any questions about this? Okay, the final uh, minimum clearance that I want to really impress upon everybody, and this is one that will catch you sooner or later, is the minimum height to a surface of indeterminate voltage. Now, what is a surface of indeterminate voltage? It's the surface, for these purposes, it's the surface on an insulator or a bushing. Because you really don't know what voltage that is. You know at the bottom of it, once it hits metal, it's grounded. Okay, but a little bit an inch above it, yeah, it's hard to know. I'll tell you, if you go and touch that, it will probably be the last thing you touch. So you want, <laughs> definitely want to stay away from it. But what this gives you is a, a base minimum that you know that you cannot go below. And, you know, whether it's an insulator or I'll tell you one that you see a lot of times that this is done wrong, on our station auxiliary transformers. You hang a little pot on a, the leg of one of your structures and you, that you can get to uh, an appropriate voltage because you've got to get a source for station ox power. 
and you've got to be really careful about it because, again, it's a really easy thing, particularly when you're in a crowded substation, to end up not meeting that, uh, not meeting that minimum. Okay, uh, other clearance requirements. Whatever we install in the substation, you have to get, be able to get to it for, uh, for maintenance. So, you know, um, in many cases that will involve uh, drive access as well. You know, you may have to drive up to it uh, with, a, um, you know, maintenance crews may have vehicles they use. It may involve, if it's a big transformer, making sure you've got crane access to it. Um, all sorts of different uh, things need to get access uh, for, for, you know, also for drive access. Think about the turn radius that we typically put in when we're laying out a substation. It does not accommodate anything generally more than about 30 feet. Well, what if you have to bring in a new sub or a new uh, a control building? You know, um, typical, uh, these drop-in control buildings that we design, they can go up to um, 49 feet long. Well, that becomes a problem. And if you do a bunch of these, you're going to run into cases where you, you simply don't have normal drive access. And there's all sorts of gizmos and gadgets and strategies for getting around them. My favorite is this contraption called a Goldhofer um, trailer that has on each side about 10 wheels and it goes about two miles an hour and you can put the building on it and a guy walks behind it with a cable attached to it and he's got this literally a control panel in front of him and he literally walks the thing in and the thing can <laughs> literally turn 90 degrees without moving each wheel can to do all sorts of, of uh, crazy things. But anyway, interesting aspects. And again, if you're, if you're uh, working with a utility that's got established standards, that's going to provide you the direction that you need. However, if you're not, you really need to talk to some people and do some research. And also, talk to the you know, prospective owner and find out what they plan to do there and find out if there's anything unusual that might be coming uh, for that substation. Okay, one last thing on drive access, um, clearance to live parts. Uh, you have to you know, keep track of what's above you. We did one project, um, actually I showed it to you in the first class at a place called El Segundo uh, near uh, LAX. And uh, the, dr the drive access for fire department was really tight in, in a, um, certain areas, and literally, we had to, to move a fence around, you know, back and forth to prevent the uh, uh, fire trucks from getting too close to this one uh, place that we had some uh, conductors going up to uh, connect to the transmission line. Uh, a lot of issues to keep track of there, and uh, anyway, these are things that inevitably, at some point, you'll run into. Okay, on this picture, Let's look at the different things where you've got, you would have clearance issues. First off, these are uh, single pole, uh, let me do this. The, each of these is a single pole 500 kV breaker and you can drive around these things. So first off, from these jumpers to ground, that is a, a clearance you're going to want to be careful of. The base of this disconnect is grounded, so from there up to that jumper, got to be real careful of that. Uh, anyone else see anything you might want to be careful about? How about the clearance from this uh, strain bus up here to whatever conductors are below it? Oh my God, I think if you had a flash over there. Ah, oh, be like matter and antimatter colliding. Okay, does that all make sense? Matt. Yeah. You also want to look at when the switch is open, so that ground is, you know, would that be close enough to anything that might be open enough? Oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you want to make sure everything around, anything that's going to be moving like a switch, you're going to have plenty of clearance in both open and closed positions. Okay, here's a picture of a 69 kV breaker. I think you guys have seen this picture before. Uh, much more compact. Don't have nearly as big clearances between things. And this isn't all that good of a picture for these purposes, although it illustrates 
The concepts are exactly the same, but the, the, the distances are so much smaller, and you're going to be um, asked to put a lot of stuff close together. I find that the biggest challenges in design often are medium voltage, you know, distribution substation where you've got um, a relatively small structure and you have to put a lot of stuff in it. And the clearance problems that you can get in there are really significant. It's, it's one of the reasons that you, you know, spend a lot of time on these designs and then you want to make, them, uh, you make sure that they're really thoroughly uh, QA checked. Um, again, it, it can be really humbling when you get a phone call and someone lets you know you've got a clearance problem on one of your projects. Uh, it, you'll, it's a real good way to lose sleep, let me tell you. Okay, uh, here's a, a 115, or excuse me, a 230 kV uh, uh, example, a big row of, of, of circuit breakers. Again, you can see the clearances that you're having to get to. You've got a bunch of disconnect switches, and you're going to have a clearance that's Oh, somewhere around 84 inches between the steel base of those uh, of those switch stands and in, you know uh, the, the conductors on the uh, on the, the that are connecting to the bushings of the breaker. Now, interesting. Here's an interesting one. Not all that many uh, utilities will do this, but you see how the the top of the you've got the top of the bushing, and then they're coming off of that with a bar and then making the connection down below the bar. Very few utilities do this. Southern California Edison does. You've heard of acid rain? They have acid fog. And what you'll get when you get condensation on those conductors, get a little bit of a, a drip and then another drip. And if it's on the bushing, it's gonna go down the skirts of the bushing and that'll lead to a flashover. However, if you put this bar off of here, all those drips are gonna go right down to the ground and uh, no one's worse for it. Now, if you've never designed anything for SCE and you go and design something the way you normally would in Portland, you're not gonna know that. So again, it just illustrates the importance of understanding the uh, the standards of the utilities you're working for. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, let's change topics just a little bit. And instead of ampacity, or uh, uh, voltage, we're gonna talk about um, current and ampacity. This is kind of like, think of them as cousins. <clears throat> They're closely related, but they are not the same. In the case of current, it's actually the motion of the electrons in the uh, conductor. And the way it generates heat is the square of the current times resistance. Now that means that if you have a, an ampacity issue, say you've got a conductor, and I'm going to use this as my example. Say this is good for Oh, 1,200 amps, just kind of making this up. And at 300 amps, you have a certain amount of heat that's being dissipated. Well, at 600 amps, it's going to be doubled, or excuse me, uh, quadrupled, because it's going up by the square. At 1,200 amps, you're going to have 16 times the amount of heat. So when you... Um, you know, it's something you want to kind of keep track of and think about as you're uh, doing your design, that you have the appropriate ampacity for your conductors. Well, how are you going to know what a given conductor is good for? This is a really good source. This Anderson catalog has table after table of conductors that um, we use in substations. Highly recommend this. However, there are other, um, you know, tabulated uh, data uh, books and whatnot around. I think there's one that's called the Lineman's um, Handbook, and there's, there are a few others around that will do it. Now, every time you see a table, there should be footnotes that tell you the assumptions on 
what temperature ambient air it is and how much you're allowing it to heat up. And, you know, and so, for instance, if it's 40 degree ambient and you're allowing it to heat 30 degrees, you've got 70 degree C conductor. Well, is there anything magic about 70 degrees? Well, no, not really. It's pretty warm, but it's not like it's the aluminum is going to catch fire or melt. You can go to 100 degrees. But again, this is, is where do you feel safe? This is a lot of the judgments that you have to use. And again, if you're working for an established utility, they're going to have standards on this. However, if you're working for you know, something other than an established utility, or it's just some really unique uh, design, you're going to have to, to look up, you know, look into it and give it a lot more thought. And this is a really good thing to do early in a project. There's a document that we like to do at the beginning of a project called design criteria. And this is where you want to address this issue. If you're changing the impasse or arguing over impasses of conductor in your final QA check, that is a really bad sign. You're probably going to be in for a, a rather difficult time. Um, IEEE 738 is a way to, to calculate the ampacities very precisely of conductors. It will take into account uh, sunshine, the orientation of your conductor, um, all sorts of things that in, you know, in, in a, a, a reference like this, they're not going to worry about that. And, and so this is probably going to give you a more conservative answer. But again, um, there are times when you're going to want to, uh, to go and be a little more precise in it. Now, on a different, you know, that, that's addressing how much is, is this, say, this conductor, this is a piece of uh, 1033 KC mil ACSR. And again, 1,200-ish eh, amps is probably a little high for it, maybe 1,000. But uh, think of uh, ampacity, your ampacity requirements um, differently and think of it as a requirement uh, for the substation. You're going to have as part of your, your design criteria, like what is the, the, the main bus in the substation have to be rated for? You know, is it 2,000 amps? Is it 3,000 amps? And then what does each terminal need to be rated for? And all of that needs to be recorded in the uh, design criteria, but even before you write it down, it needs to be thought through so that it makes sense, so that for sure you're not going to be about two years down the road and realize you built something that was really insufficient for the, for the needs. So again, these are, are things you really want to think through uh, real early in a substation or in a substation project. There's a rule of thumb I want to, um, in fact, if, if you just remember one thing from this class, this is probably a pretty good choice. <clears throat> when you're building a substation, you're going to have a bunch of equipment, a bunch of conductors, and uh, then all the stuff that makes it all fit together you're going to want to make sure that the conductors are not the thing that limits, is the limiting factor in the rating of the substation. Okay, because that piece of aluminum is a lot cheaper than a circuit breaker. In general, you should not have, if you've got a 1200 amp circuit breaker, make sure the jumpers going to it are more than 1200 amps. <laughs> Does that make sense? Now, can you think of a time when you wouldn't do this? Say you've got a 1200 amp circuit breaker <clears throat> and you're connecting it to a capacitor bank that only draws 100 amps. In that case, would you want to do it? Well, probably not. But I, I'd certainly want to get it more than 100. But uh, anyway, the general principle, though, remains make sure your conductors are greater than your uh, equipment rating. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about conductor types. There are zillions of kinds of conductors. 
And I want to focus just on a couple. And they're going to, the ones I want to talk about are, fall into two categories, solid and stranded. Um, typical solid conductors that we use are uh, tube aluminum. That's probably the most common. And the, the big tubes are really convenient, particularly for higher voltages, because they don't, uh, they're not susceptible to corona. Um, if, for instance, at 230, the smallest conductor you should use is probably around this 1033. And again, it depends on the philosophy and the utility. Um, a lot of people, uh, Portland in general, doesn't like anything less than 1272. Because the smaller you get, <clears throat> the harder or the, the higher the voltage gradient is going to be right around the conductor. And it's that voltage gradient that causes corona. Okay, so you, it, it's just considered poor form to walk into a substation and have it really loud and snapping and crackling and popping. Whereas if you have, say, a three-inch tube, the chances, you know, you're just simply not going to have that high of a, a gradient around it. And, you know, on um, typical 500 kV, um, most people won't use smaller than a five-inch tube. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, there are a couple kinds of tube, uh, just like with PVC, there's Schedule 40 and Schedule 80, Schedule 80 being a thicker wall, and obviously higher, uh, you know, it'll conduct, uh, conduct better. And again, there's tables of plenty in here telling you how to use this. Um, bar aluminum is a really convenient way to design distribution switch racks. You know, if you're, you're in the, the 15 kV range, uh, really convenient. One of the reasons is, okay, you've got a tube, piece of tube. How do you connect a four-hole pad to it? Well, there's a couple ways. You can take a fitting like this and weld it on. Or if you're at the end of the tube, you can stick this thing in it and weld it around it. But if you have a, a, just a bar of aluminum, you know, pretend this is a, a big long bar and this doesn't have holes in it, well, you can take a pad like this, put it up to the side, drill four holes, put your bolts in, and you're done. Very, very convenient. Save a bunch of time and effort on your fittings. Portland General does this uh, on quite a few of their substations. In fact, they actually use angle. So you're going to have, you know, this big long bar, that's going to be like this. So to connect to uh, a, uh, an insulator, you drill holes here. To connect to a four-hole pad, you drill them uh, on the vertical uh, face. That makes sense? Again, anything you can do to make it easier is generally much uh, appreciated. OK, there's two types of stranded conductor I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is called AAC, or all-aluminum conductor. And then um, the, the one I have an example of is ACSR, or all aluminum steel reinforced. Now, if you look at this, again, this is 1033, you can see that there are seven strands of steel on the inside of this. Then the rest of them are strands of aluminum. Okay, when you're considering the electrical and you know, ampacity characteristics of this ignore the steel. It's a pretty good conductor, but nowhere near as good as aluminum. When you're considering the strength, the structural characteristics of it, ignore the aluminum and just pay attention to steel. Aluminum is pretty dang strong, but nowhere near as strong as steel. Steel is just magical in its strength. Now, the people that came up with these this has always been a puzzle to me. For some reason, they have what are called cable codes. And I kid you not, I could not make this up. For ACSR, they use birds. Um, there's a, a very common conductor for 500 kV that's used all over the southwest called 1272 ACSR, excuse me, uh, uh, 2156 ACSR. And it is known as bluebird. I do not, I cannot explain to you why that is the case, but it is. And every one of these gets its own code. For AAC, they use flowers. 
Marigold is, is, uh, is a typical one of these. Can't tell you why, but it's kind of an, uh, an interesting, I guess, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat colorful aspect of that. Any, any, are any questions on this? Okay, now then, here's the problem. Say you have two pieces of conductor and you want to join them together. How do you do it? You have to use a connector. And this is where the fun begins. This is kind of, these are, think of these as the tinker toys of high voltage electricity. There really are three ways to connect things together. You can weld them, you can bolt them, or can, you can use compression. And I'm going to try and give you examples of all three, although I don't have a particularly good bolted connection. When you, when you connect them together, let's say that we're going to take this and this and bolt them together. Say this is, this is a, these are both, by the way, four hole pads. You probably see where they've got the name. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Um, and there's a, a common spacing on these. These are called NEMA four hole pads, and there's an uh, inch and three quarters between the holes. It's always an inch and three quarters between the holes. It's also the same dimension as inside your control building, um, the rack units on relay panels. Anyone know in millimeters how many it is? And that'll be your homework, figure out how many millimeters it is. Now, say we wanted to join this and this together, and we put them together, and I, I think, well, they're touching. That's got to be good enough. And I put one bolt through them. Is that really a good idea or not? And how tight do I need to get the bolts on them? Okay, well, this introduces an interesting concept, and that is that the ampacity of a connection like this, first off, it's kind of hard to, to, to measure and figure out, but it's going to be proportional to the pressure that you cram, you know, that you, you put these things together with. And so you're going to want to have bolts going through here and have them torqued down good and tight. Okay, and again, the best analogy I can give you to this is <clears throat> not electrical connectivity, but thermal conductivity, and fill a, 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 your coffee mug with good hot coffee or, or tea, and you can touch it, and 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 you know not have to, to you know pull your fingers away, but if you put enough pressure on it that you can lift it up, you probably can't. And again, you're going to get the the more pressure you have on that, the more thermal conductivity you'll have. Well, you have the same principle in electricity. So a rule of thumb on this is every bolt hole gives you 500 amps. So if you're going to bolt this and this together, and let's assume that they're, you know, they're good and flat, they're going to make contact as you expect, 2,000 amps. Seem reasonable? Now then. What if we do this and put these together like this? So we've sandwiched this guy. Now, how many, how many amps could go through this? We still have four bolts, but we're, we're, we get it on both sides. Well, that doubles it. Now, when you do that, you're going to want to make sure that this bar of aluminum can take that. And again, it's, there isn't a particularly good way to know the exact ampacity of this, so you need to investigate this from a couple different angles. First off, the 500 bolt or 500 amps per bolt rule of thumb is a good place to start. I would also find the ampacity of the bar of aluminum that's that thick. Okay, and if it's not 4,000 amps, then don't think that you're going to get 4,000 amps out of this. Okay. Now, these, there's all sorts of things. In fact, for the next class, 
for those of you that are actually you know, doing outdoor design work, um, I'm sure you've got a catalog that you're using that's full of stuff, little uh, fittings like this. If you guys could bring that, bring one of those, it would be kind of a handy thing to look at. I assume that they still have catalogs rather than being all online. Yours is online. Okay. Send me a link to it, and then maybe next next week I'll put it online and we can go through. Because there's, there's hundreds of different variations of these. Okay, so anyway, what I'm talking about right now is welded or is bolted connections, and there are all sorts of variations of this. Another way to connect things is to weld them. Now, this is a good example of a welded fitting. This is what's called a center form four hole pad, and I don't know what, I assume that's three inch tube. So this thing would fit inside the tube, and then you'd run a very thick weld around the end of it, and then this gives you, um, again, it's called center form because this is, um, that face is halfway uh, on, on your tube. It's the center of the tube. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, doing this presumes you have a good welder. What if you design a welded bus and the contractor later comes to you and says, dude, I don't have a welder. Well, that's kind of awkward, isn't it? <laughs> and it happens. Um, welding is, is really an art. And um, I will just say there aren't as many good welders now as there were 20 years ago. You can actually do the same thing. There's a, a company called DMC that has, for every welded um, fitting, they've got a comparable compression fitting. And um, again, in, in future classes, I'll try to, to find their website. And we can just do a, an entire hour just looking at various uh, fittings and all. The idea with compression is really kind of an interesting one. Now remember that the tighter you keep the pressure on something, the better um, that it will conduct. Well, this is a compression fitting. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure what its purpose was, but it was sitting in someone's, uh, in someone's cubicle. And it's aluminum conductor. There's no doesn't appear to be steel on the inside of it. And so they put this thing around it, and it looks something like the barrel of this. This is, uh, is a thing called a shotgun. It looks like the barrel of this. And then you put a, um, Sam, what, what do you call the a hydraulic jack? It's not a hydraulic jack. There's a name for, for the, the, the yeah. Yeah, there's 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 a name for this tool. Anyway, it's a it's kind of a big thing, and it puts tens of thousands of pounds of pressure on this. And if you were to cut this in half, you would get to um, the on the surface. You really wouldn't be able to distinguish where the old fitting and the conductor used to 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 uh, stop and start. They're all they they are essentially one when you do this. This is the, the best way to do, uh, to apply, say this had a four hole pad on it, is the example that I've got in one of the pictures coming up is like this. Say you've got a strain bus and you need to tap into it. Well, you could put a fitting like this around it that has a four hole pad on it, then you compress it to the, uh, the cable and that's gonna be a really good high impacity fitting. In fact, let me go, uh, bear with me. Well, by the way, for this class, I'm not going to address uh, copper. Copper has its own world of fittings. It's not used that often anymore, so I'm really going to skip it with just one minor additional thought, that if you ever have to connect copper and aluminum together, you have to um, take provisions for that. The two actually have a slightly different uh, surface voltage on them. And what will happen is, if you put them together, that causes corrosion. So when water gets on them, the copper will actually kind of liberates the copper, a big long streak of green below it. 
and uh, ah, generally considered poor form. There, there's a number of different strategies to get around that. Uh, but anyway, just suffice to say, you need to address that if you're trying to connect the two together. Okay, again, I got kind of ahead of my slide here. I'm um, talking about the uh, the importance of contact pressure, and then I'm gonna I've got an example of that in a picture coming up. But before I go there, one last thought on getting your, your project built. If you can find out, <laughs> if you can find out what a, the contractor that's going to build your uh, substation is good at, design it that way. Because if they if if they look good, you will look good. And if you don't, um, well, good luck with it, you know. Um, anyway, there, there's another, uh, uh, that proven approach right there is another good thing to take away from this class. Okay. The butts fitting, I think I've covered all of this. Again, these are basically the tinker toys of high voltage electricity. Um, you know, I... Bear with me a moment. There's a picture I want to share here. Okay. Let's look at all the fittings that we have in this. Let's start off, because this is the one I wanted to show you all. Okay, it's hard to see this very well. But what each one of those things is, is actually not this. It's a bolted version of this. And Edison's reason for not using compression is that they can get good enough ampacity out of bolted, but if they want to move them, they can. Once you've compressed this, it's there, it's permanent. All you can do is just cut off the, uh, the four hole pad. Now then, if you take a thermal picture of their substation, Every one of those fittings shows up as being really hot. But again, you can't get as, it's just not possible to get as much uh, contact pressure out of, out of a bolted fitting as you can out of, out of this. Hydraulics, modern hydraulics are just, I mean, it's way more than a torque wrench is ever going to do for you. It's just not possible. Okay, um, let's see what other fittings are around here. This is a, a pretty simple one right there. That's a spacer. Anytime you're going to use bundled conductor, you want to make sure the bundles stay at a certain distance apart. And, you know, mostly it's aesthetics, frankly. If they weren't there, probably wouldn't be the end of the world. However, let's think about the importance of aesthetics. When you're doing your designs, say you don't keep your conductors in a nice tight bundle and they look a little funky. However, it doesn't really violate any, you know, clearance issues or anything. Is there anything inherently wrong with that? Well, I would say yes, and I'll point to two things. One, it looks sloppy. You don't want to look, have your work look sloppy. You just don't. But the other thing that you're going to do <laughs> is everyone that walks in to that substation is going to stop and is going to look at it. And then they're going to call their buddy over, and then they're going to talk about that. And it's going to waste a bunch of time. And it's, it's kind of almost silly, but it's just human nature that that will happen. So if you, if you don't have a nice, neat, symmetrical, aesthetically pleasing design, you're wasting a bunch of other people's time. And it's something I hope you consider as you're, as you're doing your work. Okay, next fitting. Well, uh, one one quick question on the um, on the uh, on that on that spacer. Is that a current carrying conductor or a connector or not? Does it conduct current? Does it matter? I'm seeing one person say it is not a current carrying conductor. How about the rest of you? Does it conduct current? Does it need to? Could you make that out of an insulator and have it function properly correct? Think of these fittings. There's many ways to break them down, but another way to break them down is do they conduct electricity or not? And a spacer does not. You know, it could as easily be an insulator. You can get a spacer with a four-hole pad on it. 
How much can current now? Now it is a current carrying conductor. How much current can that carry? Oh, little tiny, tiny amount. Ooh, little teeny bitty currents. They're good for PTs. If you want to put a, you want to check the potential of that because you know your PT is going to draw microamps or milliamps. It's going to be hardly anything. So there, it's okay. But I, I had this long, long, long time ago. Some friends of mine in. Um, it was somewhere in the Rocky Mountain states, designed one, and they didn't know that. And um, they, so they actually were carrying current through that very thing that Matt's pointing out. And boy, they got a thermal image back, and that thing was red hot. Well, lumen doesn't get red hot, but it was, it was nasty. And they had to go back and pay someone to fix that. Yeah, really bad idea. Okay, um, where I've got the, the cursor is at the top of an insulator. And what I would call that would be a, a station post to, and you'd have to define the, the uh, bolt circle. I don't remember really what the bolt circle is at the top of a 500 kV insulator. But anyway, you, it would be, it's called a five inch bolt circle to parallel uh, cable connection. I've got one of these, except it's only for one. And this is for your, your bolt circle. That should be five inches. It, eh, it could be three inches, hard to say. But anyhow, you can see that this gives you the option of putting it this way or being off by 45 degrees. And then this would bolt directly to an insulator there. And you can pass this around if you all are real gentle and don't, don't hit each other with it. Okay, um, let's see what else we can find in this. Um, picture. It's kind of hard to see some of my favorite ones, but there's one right up here that I've got. Couldn't find a better picture of this. Okay, this is a, a strain bus, and any any time I'm referring to. Um, stranded conductors going horizontally in a substation. That's what I'm going to call a strain bus. And as you come to the end of this, you have something that looks like this. And this, uh, is, there's a fancy name for this, and it's some kind of dead end, but the world pretty much calls these shotguns. And the idea is you have this piece of steel here and it gets compressed in place. Then you put your conductor in this end, and then you compress it and you work it out from one end out. And this thing will grow from here, it'll get about that long, about double in length once you compress it out. Now there's a couple variations of these things. You can get them with four hole pads on both sides, as an example. And there's a different version for ACSR and AAC. I think this is the version for AAC. For ACSR, you actually take the steel and peel back some of the aluminum. You take the steel out and connect the steel to this uh, end piece before you, you compress it down. It makes it incredibly strong. Okay, any questions about that? Now then, something to, to um, there's a couple different ways of manufacturing these things. Notice that this one, the surface is shiny, and this one, it's dull and kind of rough. This is a sand casting. Um, they're ba it's basically a way of making aluminum parts, and you, you, it's basically sand infused with oil. You put a mold in it, press it down, break the thing open, take the mold out, and put the... Uh, the aluminum in. I've never done it, but this is what I, I, I've been told. But anyway, it gives you, you know, one sort of finish on it. And different utilities, some think this is better, but some think that this is better, and this is extruded. This is the same way that you make tube aluminum. There's a big machine that has molten aluminum in it, and it squirts it out and extrudes it into whatever shape you want. In this case, it's a tube. This can have voids in it. This cannot. That's probably the reason a lot of people like this. 
it's easier though to get different shapes with this one. So anyway, two schools of thought on that. And again, you can pass these around. Now, notice something about this when you, when you look at this. Feel the sides of the four hole pad. One's machined, one's not. You can only connect to a side that's been machined. So if you want to put two of, of something on this, you gotta machine both sides. You can do that with this one. I can put one on this side and one on this side, because again, both sides are smooth, but you can't with this, this is only one side. Okay, two questions were, first off, can you give examples of what these things would be connecting to? And then the second one was kind of, if I'm paraphrasing, where do you start? Okay, this is the, um, the shotgun if you see at the end of this strain bus, and I don't have a very good picture of it. I'll get as close as I can before it pixelates. That's a shotgun at the end. And again, I don't have that good of a picture of it. So your <coughs> you transmission line, um, you come to a dead end on the transmission line. This is what you'd, you'd put there. And then this then connects to uh, well, yeah, pretend that this is the, the live end. This connects through here. Okay, this is a strain bus. Let's see how good of a picture I can draw of this. My photo, my photo kind of breaks up here. <clears throat> okay. I can show you this on Google Earth. So this is a strain bus. This is about 180 feet. And so you've got two bays of 500 kV can connect to this bus. But say you want to have eight bays in the substation. Well, you, you go out four spans. But each one of these, you're going to dead end it at that insulator. And so you put a shotgun there and shotgun here. It's got a four-hole pad, then you put a jumper from there to there. And that's what you're actually seeing in this picture. In fact, here in a minute, if you want, I can actually take you in Google Earth and show you right where that is. See how this span ends? You got insulators, a shotgun, and then you have something like this on the end of the jumper, and then it goes underneath. There's actually, um, to, to maintain and hold in place, there's actually an insulator here. That's a big weight on the bottom of it. It's a couple hundred pounds. Um, and then it goes on up to the next span. Is, is that clear? Okay. Oh, the other part of the question, how do you make sense of all this? It's kind of experience. And hopefully you start out on a project that isn't too uh, elaborate and you've got a good go by and someone answer questions. And uh, again, following uh, you know, following standards is also really uh, key and vital in this process, but also it's experience. And actually, you know, I, I really enjoy doing this. Um, I'd love to leave behind what I do right now and go back and design substations and just but do bus work the rest of, of my days. It'd be a, um, oh well, we'll leave that for discussion over beer. Okay. Be, um, I want to go through the conclusion, then we'll spend a little more time on, uh, on some more show and tell. Uh, in this class, we uh, started out introducing the concepts of, of conductor design in substations, and we started talking about uh, uh, voltage, and we had that as kind of our jumping off point into what's a very large topic, or, you know, very large, actually it's going to consume a number of classes. <clears throat> anyway, we discussed how to, to do insulators, and uh, then um, we also discussed uh, clearances and substations. And these are just meant to be introductories. This isn't supposed to give you the you know enough information to actually design a substation, but at least should get you started knowing what questions to ask. Okay, we next uh, started talking about uh, rather than voltage issues, uh, current issues, 
And this led to the introduction of a couple of different kinds of conductors, uh, both solid and stranded. And uh, we discussed tube aluminum, kind of touched on bar aluminum, and then talked about ACSR and AAC. And we're concluding with a, an ongoing discussion about bus fittings. And I like to call, think of these as the tinker toy of high voltage electricity. Okay, let's, uh, I've got a few more examples up here. These are my favorite ones. Whoops. This is a corona ring. Say you're in a 500 kV substation and you've got something that is, has some sharp angles on it. And there's just no way you can get away from the sharp angles. And I think I can find a good example of this in this picture or in one of my pictures. Um, what you want to do, if you don't do something, and this right here on this uh, disconnect switch is a good example of it. By putting this around it, and say you had one, like in this picture on the other side, everything that's within this area is going to be more or less at the same potential. And that's what you're trying to accomplish. Because if you have high voltage gradients, you're going to have corona. And if you have things that are, are particularly sharp, like bolts, for instance, ah, it's even worse. You know, you, you, if you put a nail sticking up like that, you, you could literally see a blue shine at the end of the nail just from the, the molecules of air literally getting torn apart because of the high voltage gradient there. So anyway, that's what this is. This is a, uh, is a corona ring. Any questions on that? You can pass that around. That's a thing. Now then, anyone care to guess what this is for? You know what often you need to do on your bus is, is take it out of service and work on it. And when you do, you have to ground it. And this is a place to put a grounding uh, clamp on it that's connected to uh, a grounding chain that you then connect to the ground grid of your substation. And that makes sure that the thing is going to be safe to work on. Now, since it's at um, high or extra high voltage, you want to put this doodad on the end of it to make sure that it's not going to be a source of corona. That makes sense. There's all sorts of little tricks to this. And you know, one of the ways to learn this, in fact, probably the best way to learn this is to just do it. You, you go in and you start doing projects. And after you've been through a few, you'll start to realize that you're not having to look up as many parts as you used to. And you'll be surprised. You'll actually start remembering the part numbers. And then when you're driving down the street, you'll actually find yourself turning off and driving past substations just because you enjoy looking at them. That's when you know you're hooked. Anyway, any, any parting questions, any parting comments with that? Okay. Again, next class, we're going to approach almost exactly the same topics, many of the same pictures, many of the same fittings. But instead of looking at their electrical properties, we're going to uh, look at their structural properties. Because the electrical properties are relatively worthless if they don't stay up in the air. OK, that's all I've got for today. All right, thank you.